Yeah, I think we're officially live. I think we are officially live and actually right on time. Guess what? Good morning. Happy Friday. It's 8.01 a.m. on April 24th. Let's flex those muscles. Let's get ready to do something really, really exciting today. I uh, was sitting there trying to think for a lot of time this week what to do because I hadn't had time to think about it because I've been so busy with the Bulletproof Bookkeeping launch. And uh, Greg and I spoke a little bit. I was like, I don't know what to talk about this Friday. And then I was browsing around last night, and I do this sometimes. I go into our Facebook group, and then I go into other Facebook groups, and I look around and I see what are people struggling with that I can help with. You know, that to me is the the best way. Larry says, you are live. Good morning, Larry. Um, and I, it's somebody, I think, in our 97 and Up group this week had asked a question, and then it stuck out to me because I was in the uh, the bookkeeping side hustle group. And near the top of the feed, as I was scrolling down, looking at people's questions, uh, I saw a similar question. Basically, you know, has anybody created like an accounting manual for, for your client? And I've gotten asked about this over the years. And, and in fact, the reply I wrote to the person who asked about it uh, this week was, you know, I've started these so many times, but I've never finished them, you know. Um, because it ends up being a lot of work, of course, depending on how you define what that looks like. So that's part of what I want to spend this morning on is defining what that looks like, right? And then deciding how much should we charge for it. And then when it comes to the pricing part, which we'll talk about, you know, you know, in the, in the latter part of the morning, um, I think what, what will happen, what you'll see, what I plan to present this morning is that first we have to have a picture of what it looks like, assuming we want to go full book, go the whole distance, you know, really do something detailed, robust, like, you know, just a bang up job on the best accounting manual you could possibly imagine creating for somebody. And what would that price look like? And then assuming somebody didn't want to spend the money, what would the other end of the spectrum look like, right? Just like in accounting, I have, you know, compliance, like it's just okay, it's, it's good enough. And then there's bulletproof, right? Which means I've really put the extra time and effort into making sure I've got a good audit trail in place and make sure I can prove every number. So we want to come up with the sort of uh, accounting manual creation equivalent of compliance versus bulletproof, right? And, you know, the, way, the, the, the example I often think of is, you know, what Ron Baker had shared with me a couple of years ago that when he uh, was looking to hire a landscaper, you know, the landscaper presented him with essentially those two options. He says, I can give you the best curb appeal on the block and it's this price, or I can keep you up with the block and, and here's that price, right? And when it comes to pricing, that's, I think, a great way to think about how to break it down. And then, of course, mixed into that, you know, we always, I always encourage people to think what, what amount of money will get you excited to do the work, right? Because that's really the ultimate test. If I'm getting paid really well, you know, I feel like I'm getting paid really well, then I'm going to be that much more excited to do that much better of a job. I'm not going to sit there worrying about how much time I'm spending. I'm going to be more concerned with just delivering the most amazing value I possibly can to the client. That's how we should be pricing anything that we do, you know, including this. Uh, and I think oftentimes the client's expectation may in fact be that we'll create this training manual and that it's just free right? It's included. Well, you're doing the work anyway. It should be easy for you, right? How many times do we hear that? This should be easy for you. Well, the reason it's easy for me is because I've put in my 10,000 hours plus on this stuff. So it's just because it's easy for me doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of value. In fact, if anything, that means it does have tremendous value, right? So that's the, uh, the sort of thinking I want to put out there and put up front as we're going into a process like this. So the first thing I thought about was where are we going to do this, right? And I think that it's fair to say that what makes a lot of sense is to do this in Google Docs, right? Because Google Docs is collaborative, it's easy to share, and as you're going to see, you can create something pretty slick, right? So we're going to create a new Google document. And for now, we'll call it My Accounting Manual. And of course, we want to outline this. What's going to go in the manual? How are we going to structure it, 
right? So the first thing is to start an outline. But before we even go too deep into the outline, once we've defined at least what we think the first section of it is going to be, my recommendation is flesh out that section. Get like a concept in place, right? And then once that's done, we can present that to the client and say, this is the best curb appeal on the block. When I flesh this out and I, I've got this done for the first part, this is what it's going to look like through and through. Do you want to pay that price? Or I can give you a much more superficial, just kind of a list of the areas that need to be managed and a brief description of what needs to be done weekly, monthly, you know, annually, what have you, right? So you give them the two extremes and let the client decide. What do they want? They want to spend the money and get something incredible or do they want to just do the minimum amount, right? Which is it? So starting with the outline and anybody who knows me can probably guess exactly how I'm going to start this off, right? Let me pull up my participant queue here and my chat queue so I can see what people are saying. So if we're creating an accounting manual, it's probably not that much different than the process of what we do day to day, week to week, month to month, right? And what do I always say I do when I want to manage somebody's accounting is I beat the hell out of the balance sheet first and then we go through the P&L, right? So that's how I want to structure my accounting manual. The first thing we need to do is look at banking and bank feeds, right? So let's start there, all right? And I'll just, bullet, I'll just start creating some bullet points, right? Then, so how do we manage the banking and the bank feeds, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll fill in the details, but you know, just at the quick outset, we're gonna talk about setting up the bank feeds, downloading, creating the rules, you know, we're going to start outlining what needs to be done to manage the banking and the bank feeds every week, then every month when we reconcile, then, then whatever kind of review process we may have, you know, after the fact, monthly, quarterly, and so on. So that, as Greg and I often talk about, if we do this right, by the end of the year, there's no big year-end rush. It's just getting December done, and then everything's done, right? That's the way it should be if we manage this correctly. So next, we'll have accounts receivable, right? We might have some other current assets, right? Maybe we have some employee advances on the books, right? We want to make sure those are cleaned up. I've almost never seen this clean. Every time I look at a balance sheet and I see employee advances, it's usually stuff from six months ago that, you know, either got paid back and wasn't recorded right or never got paid back is never going to be paid back. It's, it's very rare that I've seen an employee advances account on a balance sheet where it's like, oh yeah, we just loaned that money out last payroll and it's going to get paid back this payroll. I've just never seen employee advances done clean. Um, and usually I end up just having to write it off, whatever it is. So, uh, but wouldn't it be nice to have that actually managed properly where the advance is made through payroll and then it's recouped the same way. That would be neat. Um, Fixed assets, right? What else? Help me out here. Accounts payable, right? Maybe we have some long-term assets. Um, I don't know. How about sales tax? There we go. Down the liability Pay section, sales tax payable. Payroll taxes. Right, which means we're managing payroll. Right. Or at least recon reconciling it. Yep. Payroll liabilities, we'll call that. Right. But I want to just be clear. Payroll liabilities just means bigger picture payroll, right? Means yeah. We're managing payroll for the client sales taxes. You know, that in itself is something to manage. But of course, that's going to tie into our accounts receivable and our sales, which is on the P&L, which is why I'm so focused on the balance sheet. Because as you start outlining something like this, you start to see where getting this process down will help us, it will largely take care of the P&L along the way, right? So when we're creating a manual, it's much like what I, the way I outline the process of what I do every week. Of course, that's the point of the manual is to show somebody, here's what we do every week, right? So, um, How about course, inventory? Perfect. Inventory back up in the assets section. Equity, contributions, distributions. Right. Right, do we have opening balances that we need to look at or clean up? Prepaid right. expenses. There we go. That's like your favorite topic this week, Greg. <laughs> it is.
Why doesn't it like my hyphenated prepaid? I guess it is just one word. What do I know? All right, of course, what we could do is section this off, right? Like this, assets. Which, notice what just started to happen. I'm going to show you this in a minute. Which goes back to specifically why I like Google Docs for this. You see what happened on my left? As soon as I bolded assets, what we're looking at here on my left is the document outline. And it's linked. So now if I bold accounts payable, right? This is why I like Google Docs for creating a manual like this because later on accounts payable is gonna become its own section further down the document. And what the outline tool in Google Docs starts to do is it starts to create almost like a table of contents here that's, that's interactive that you can click on. And the key is to understand how this gets developed or evolved, right? So right now I've got, you know, the bullet point outline format and it's created, it created these two things because I bolded them, right? So it starts to see bold face text as something that indicates some kind of a section or subsection, right? What I can also do, if I go back up here, bigger picture is, let's say I wanna call this page the outline, right? But here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this a heading one designation. And you see what the document outline does? So it puts that in a hierarchy. So heading one gets the highest level. Bold is a little lower level, right? So I might do balance sheet breakdown or something like that. And let's make this heading two. So you see how that comes together? So you have heading one, heading two, heading three, and then you have bold. That's kind of your hierarchy of how this is going to develop for you on the left, right? So if you keep that in mind while you're building this out, this becomes a perfect tool. And this is why I thought about this. Would I wanna break this up into several documents for each area? And the answer is no, because with this in place, it's very manageable and, and very convenient to have everything in one document where I can easily click around and get down to the particular section that I want to look at, right? So we could start with this kind of an, you know, an outline. Equity, of course, here needs to be its own section. And these can come back. And now it's being a little fickle because I did it after the fact. So notice it didn't create the equity section there. So sometimes you have to force it. There we go. And that's why accounts payable work. So evidently it wants to see a space there before the next thing so that it sees it as its own separate kind of header, right? So again, it's really critical to pay attention to the behavior here. And notice as I move my mouse around it, it gives me this X. If for some reason I don't want balance sheet breakdown in the outline here, I can get rid of it, but I caution against doing that. I would, I would urge you to consider instead just using the formatting options to decide what gets into the outline and what doesn't, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to, to do it because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I know how to get it back, to be honest with you. I haven't played with it that deeply because um, I've just relied entirely on understanding, you know, again, header one, header two, bold, it works, I'll stick with it, right? So now what I might do here is, after I'm done kind of working on the outline, let's insert a page break. Okay, and this next, this first page is gonna be the first part of the outline, right? So we're gonna do banking and bank feeds, okay? And let's make this H1. Okay, and now I can start, um, you know, writing up the description. Now, of course, what I love about this, and this is where I'm, you know, what I'm talking about when I say you can get really robust with this. Let's go into the QBO test drive. Of course, if I was doing this for a client, I would use their own actual bank feeds in this. So I might start with a list of the accounts that need to be managed, right? 
So here we have checking and savings, right? Hopefully we're a little more detailed in the way we name these things. Actually, let me not do this as an outline. Let's do these as H2. Okay, and now I can go in here and get into the details, right? So let's go over to banking. Right, and I might take a screenshot of what this looks like. So, so just to keep track of the list of tools that we're going through today, right? I have Google Docs, that's the main tool so far. Now we're gonna introduce Snagit. Now I have Snagit installed and configured that when I hit the print screen button on my keyboard, it'll take a screenshot. And if I just click here, it should, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. It usually gives you this opportunity. So I don't need the subscribe now piece, right? Consider the user experience. Um, and so I might wanna start with a screenshot like this. I can click that to grab the screenshot. Then I'll bring this up, the editor. And you know, there's lots of little tools. This is very easy to use, right? So I can just use an arrow to point this out. I might use a shape like a red circle like this to highlight the fact that this is the selected bank account right now. Uh, sometimes it's a little touchy about those little dots that I wanna use to resize it. There we go. Right, make sure that when you're using these things, you're not blocking anything with them. Right, so just, you know, the point is spend the time, take care so that you can, uh, make it really clear to the reader of your manual exactly what you're trying to show them, right? So the idea is I just wanna call their attention to the fact that we've gone to the banking section here, okay? And then again, these little things can matter. I like to just kind of, it's be, I've kind of used it as my little trademark when I do a screenshot on something, I just like to use this effect, right? just making it look like it was cut out of a piece of paper. You know, whatever, it might seem silly to some, but to me, these little things make a difference. Plus, I like the fact that it's like leaving my mark on something that I've created for somebody else. You know, it's, it's cool when I see, you know, that somebody else is using something of mine. I'm like, I'm flattered. So anyway, we'll save this. Okay, and I'm just gonna stick this in my My Drive folder now. Now, as you've seen in textbooks, and I've learned this from doing write-ups like this in the form of blog posts, because keep in mind what we're really doing here is we're creating content. No different than if we're writing a blog post on how to do bank feeds, right? We're just doing it for our client instead of for the public. So I might call this something like banking figure one. I want to create an audit trail of the assets that I'm using in this document that I'm creating so it's really easy to figure out what goes where. Right, so this might be 1-1, one because -one, it's like section one, figure one, right? So I've, I've, I'm sharing this with you because I've made the mistake of not taking the time to do this and then gotten really confused when I'm looking at the images in a folder and what the way I have it laid out in a document, it becomes really hard to figure out which is which, you know? And so what I'm trying to do is save myself a lot of time and headache later on. And also bear in mind, if for some reason you want this transparent, if you think it might be going on a background other than white, then do it as a PNG, because a PNG will, be, it will have a transparent background. So that can matter too. In this case, I'm not going to bother. We'll save it as a JPEG. And then watch how nicely this renders when I bring it over to the Google document. And I'm just clicking and dragging. I've got it in my folder on my other screen click, drag, and drop, okay? And you can resize it, right? But it came in, you know, pretty well sized. Sometimes what I'll do is, notice how this is showing me 80%, but this size looks pretty good. So I can go back here and adjust the size based on percentage. And if I, if I change the, the actual percentage of the thing to 80%, then that's gonna make the current view become 100%. So 100% is what this will look like. Uh, flatten all is fine. Okay, and what that does is it shrinks down the document size a little bit, which shrinks down the file size, oftentimes dramatically, right? What that did here 
if I look at the folder where it is, the size is 488 kilobytes, right? If I say control Z, undo, and save it back the way it was, hmm, I guess that didn't make much difference. Usually resizing it like this will make a dramatic difference in the size of the image. So it matters because if you're embedding these documents into the Google Doc, it's the larger the file sizes of the images you put in, the more bloated that document gets. You know, and you don't know what kind of resources the people who are going to use this are going to have. Uh, Matthew, I see your comment not to mention when you need to update the information in the future. Um, do you mind unmuting and just providing context? Because I don't know how long ago you posted that. Um, <clears throat> so I think it was when you were talking about how you were saving into specific folders. Okay, um, yeah. You know, when I, what I find is if I'm creating certain content, I will always save it. I use PowerPoint, but I'll save it in a specific file so I can go back if I have to do like changes of the screenshot for some reason. Right. I don't have to rebuild the whole world. I can actually just use what I built before, change the background, readjust where things were at, and it can save some time. Right. Yep. So you're talking about the like naming the file. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It made a big difference. Like I said, I was creating, I think it came up when I was starting to develop the assets for the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course. Because, you know, as you know, I have detailed write-ups in that course. And when I first started doing it, I was just taking screenshots and saving them in a folder. At least I had them organized in their own folder. But when it came time to grabbing those screenshots and relaying them out in Kajabi, which is where the site is built, I started getting really lost at certain points in it. And some of the screenshots looked very similar because it was showing different stages of something. And so I was like, oh man, I forget, you know, and so it, it just took a lot of extra time for me to sort of rethink it and figure out what goes first and when, right? So now, of course, in addition to this, we'll provide obviously all kinds of written instructions. We can have a section on weekly, right? And I'll bold that. And I want that to come under checking, but like I said, sometimes you have to play with this a little bit to get it to work. Let's try it this way for a second. There it is. So it has to be like in proximity to the thing it's sort of related to. Okay, so what I might do then is leave this here. If, for some, if I want to have the screenshot before the instructions, then I'll just put the word weekly because this is part of the weekly routine. So update bank feeds, dot, 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 right? And so what I want to encourage you to do, and now you can start to see how beautiful this works. So if I click back to the manual outline, you see it just takes me right there, right? Down here, I have my banking and bank feed sections. Boom, I can click savings. It takes me right there. So I love this outline. And I know Microsoft Word has the same thing, but of course what I love about doing this in Google Docs is the sharing and collaborative capabilities. And once it's done, this is going to be as easy as getting a shareable link sharing it with my client, and here's what I would normally be inclined to do, is give them view-only access and just instruct them that if they want to edit this for any reason, they can make a copy of it that's editable, but this way they can't mess with my original, right? And this way, now I have a live document that as we're going on and developing and evolving this, you know, I give them this link so they can see it. They can always view my original with that link, and as I make updates, it's just there. It's live. And this way, as I have dialogue with the client and they say, hey, can we add in a section on this, on that, you know, hopefully you can start to see where this is going and how powerful this can become, how robust a resource you can build for your clients or their bookkeepers or whomever so that, um, you know, so that they'll have something that they can use to manage their accounting when you're not there, right? Now, I know some of you might be thinking, oh, but this is going to be sort of selling me out of a job. A, who cares? You don't want to do the bookkeeping forever. If anything, there's a lot more interesting things you can be doing. Give them this or somebody else can do the bookkeeping and then you can do the advisory services, charge a lot more and work a lot less, quite frankly. So this is where I was saying in the beginning, you can see where you can give them the, you know, the right end extreme, right? Or you can, you can say, you know, what? I can give you this. Or I can just give you simple, just here's a very rough outline and brief descriptions. No screenshots, none of that. That's what you get for $500. This is what you get for $2,500, something like that, right? And I'm going to get into the pricing more specifically and more deeply, right? But the point is to get this flushed out, right? Start the outline, but as soon as possible, go in and build out the whole first section. You want to be able to give them a very detailed taste. You want to put the product in their hands and say, this is what you can get. 
you know, this is the, this is go, if you want me to go the full distance, this is what this is going to look like. Plus you can always add on a support component, right? Pay me monthly and I'll provide you with the support. Keep this up to date. I'll provide you training, whatever you need, right? There's a lot that you can build around this as a service for your clients. That's really valuable to them. Hey Seth. Yeah. Do you ever put like video links in, for example? You I was, you're getting it? ahead of me, but yes, definitely. Okay. I was going to suggest that you can absolutely record short videos. You can put them as unlisted on YouTube. I think Vimeo is better for this purpose when it's going to be private and only for the client. You can, you know, so you can absolutely record short videos in Vimeo. You can create, there's different kinds of structures you can use to create like folders where that client's stuff is kept. And then absolutely, you know, I can go in and you can even use Snagit to record the short videos, right? So if you just want to record a really quick video that shows you where to click to get into banking and where to click to update, you know, and then, cause then you're probably going to add in a section. If we go into the actual section here, uh, under weekly update bank feeds, we're probably going to want something on create bank rules, create manage banking rules, right? And this definitely would, I could see warranting a little short video. And so you can just put watch this video. And again, the, the little things matter, especially when you're trying to give them something that be, that's going to be like a really cool tool that they can use. Um, you want to make it as visual as possible. So watch this. Let's go to Emojipedia. And these little things make a big difference. Right pointing. You can just search that and you'll find the right pointing finger, I'm sure, very quickly. Okay, there it is. And then just click copy here, back over here, paste it in, and then insert video link, right? So absolutely, you can insert video tutorials to make your life easier. You know, my favorite way to sum that piece up is if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a video has got to be worth a million right? <clears throat> and they'll probably appreciate the visual context that you're giving them when you're doing a video instead of just giving them a whole lot of text. Now, some people do like to read, so I think it's important to give both. I think really to give them the complete package, you need the written outline, you need the screenshots to make it like a textbook, and then you'll probably want to stick some videos in there. And Snagit's great even if you want to create a short little GIF image, right? like just a little 10 second video file that shows them the motions of something, right? So, I mean, Snagit is just such a cool tool. It's, it's, I, I use it every single day because every day at some point I'm grabbing a screenshot of something and I'm putting it and I'm putting that screenshot somewhere, you know, whether it's something I'm putting up on Facebook, whatever it is, right? So get this whole first section fleshed out and then go to your client, right? So we're starting with the outline. We're gonna build the outline. It doesn't have to be done yet by the time we build out the whole first section, okay? We're gonna do it in one document using Google Docs with the index turned on. By the way, if you don't know how to turn this on, if it's not sort of turned on by default, then it's under view and show document outline. Notice it's checked off on mine, okay? So that's how you can turn the outline on or off. Okay, so if you don't see this here, and while it's on, you can click this just to minimize it, to close it, but it's weird because it doesn't shrink up this little margin, so I don't necessarily know why you'd want to do that, but anyway, the option's there. So, but point is, if you happen to see this, just click on it, and it's going to show the document outline, right? But this is the key to, to why it's very effective to do this all in one document, right? And it just gives you one place to go for everything. I had another similar experience recently where... Um, I had this one really big document and at first I thought this is going to be clunky, but in the end I found that it was really useful to have it all laid out in a single document. It was, um, you know, it was just basically all this content, but organized in such a way that, uh, 
it actually ended up being helpful because there was a sequence to it. It had to do actually with the bulletproof launch that I just completed as of last night. Um, and ultimately, that's what made me think this is the way to do this because, again, from experience now, I've found that it's really useful to, uh, you know, to have it all in one place like this. And then it's only one document to share with the client. It's only one place to go to make updates and so on and so forth. And Matthew, by the way, has shared with us a link to a website called resizeimage.net. And that's a great tool where you can go to shrink down the file size, right? But uh, even shrinking the dimensions of the image should already decrease the file size a lot. But depending on where this is going to go, especially if, it's, if, if for some reason what you're creating is going to go on a web page somewhere, then you definitely want to get those file sizes down to even smaller than what mine was. Mine was like 488 kilobytes. You really want them under like 100. Right, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, it's, it has to do with load times. So yeah. the smaller the file size and the more images on a single page, you know, it's going to load faster the, the more you shrink it down. And that specific site will do a couple things. It will let you change the dimensions. So you're only putting an image up in the right dimension size you need. But it will also let you compress it down for a PNG or a JPEG style uh, type file. Right. Right. And then another thing to keep in mind is there are going to be times where you want to be able to give people the option to kind of zoom in on the image, right? So you might have one version of the file that's embedded in the document, but you can link it. Notice while I've got this document selected, I can actually insert a hyperlink. So I can link this image to its larger counterpart. That way, if somebody really wants to get a, a close-up look at what they're looking at to see more detail, you can give them the, av the ability to do that. Not that I like to prove you right with Google, but that's a great idea. And that's pretty cool that you can do that with Google that way. Yeah. Yep. I love Google. So, you know, that hopefully should give you some ideas about how to get started actually creating the thing. And, 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 and what I'm really trying to address here, and I hope I've made it clear, um, is, you know, I know your concern is going to be, well, how do I have that conversation with the client? And it could go a number of ways. You could be just, you know, sort of unsolicited suggesting this to the client, but the client may ask you for it. A lot of clients ask for it. You know, I've had clients ask me for it, and oftentimes when they ask me for it, and then I, I, I bring up, you know, pricing, like I said earlier, they think it's just something we should just do for them. And it's like, no, there's value in this, and I'm happy to do it, but there's got to be a price associated with it, right? Oftentimes they balk at that, but that's why it's not necessarily a great idea to discuss pricing right up front. First, give them a sense of what they're going to get. That's why I'm saying start building the outline. Once you have even just a, I mean, this is by no means complete. There's a lot more we'd want to add to this, including the P&L part, right? After we beat up the balance sheet, we still want to go through the P&L and have a process for reviewing all of that stuff. But long before you get this completely flushed out, you'll want to just completely build out one whole section, right? Just do the whole banking and bank feed section. Let it fill it in. Robust. Lots of screenshots. Uh, you know, links to videos. Whatever. It'll it'll be some work, but I think it'll pay off in the long run because I think when you can show them something this substantial, now they're going to start to see the value. And if anything, instead of asking what the price is going to be, usually what I find is that presenting somebody with something like this, if anything, will sort of solicit responses from them along the lines of, what else can we do? What else can we add to this, right? And when you get that kind of reaction out of a client, now you're, you're, you're already past the pricing conversations. Just, you know, when you throw the price at them at that point, it's going to be much less likely they're going to balk at the price because they're already clearly seeing the value. If you're, if you're inspiring them to start thinking of ideas for how to build this out even more, how to make it even better. When you get, when you evolve the conversation to that part, then they're already past the point of realizing that this is going to be worth paying for, maybe even paying a lot for it. Right. Hey Seth. Yeah. I can give a real world example why you'd want one. I have a client that had a bookkeeper that only she knew the system. And I kept telling him, you got to get a manual. You got to, I even volunteered to do a Zoom meeting with her and watch, her, which, watch what she did. And, you know, you could create a manual. And, of course, she quit, formed, started to form a competitive, competitor company. And guess what? No one knew what to do. And so I tried to recommend someone to go in. But because things were so screwed up and no one had monitored her, that um, 
you know, you get a big mess on your hands and it's a lot easier to do it up front, to know what to do up front. And I, like I say, I must have told him at least 10 different times you need to have a, some documentation. And of course he didn't listen. So mm-hmm. get to pay the price. Yep. Yep. No question. So it's a really good, it's a really good point, Dennis. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a really good idea for a lot of reasons for the client to pay you to create something like this. Right. So let's talk about, you know, so the next, the next stage of this. So how much, you know, should the client pay? Right. And so again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw that back on you and say that I want you to think about, first of all, having built this whole thing out and looking at it. I think this is a lot of fun to create stuff like this. Probably a big part of why I do what I do. And I love the training side of things. You know, I love the idea that I can create an experience for somebody that's going to really help them, that they're going to be able to follow. And and from that, understand exactly what to do, exactly how to do it. Understand how to do something they couldn't have done before, right? The idea that I can create that experience for somebody, it, it fills me up in ways that I can't even describe. That's why I love training and teaching and educating. Um, but think about, think about it like this. If I'm going to get somebody to pay me to do something like this, I'm going to want to put a lot of time in, especially if we're going on this end of the spectrum. And I don't want to have to worry about the time. It's not about the time. It is about the value of the output, which means I want to price it in such a way that I'm not, never going to think about the time. In fact, I'm going to want to spend all the time I can because I'm really excited to get this job done and I'm really excited to do an amazing job for the client. In fact, I'm so excited I can't wait to have it finished and hand it off to the client and have the client be like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? And instead of you know questioning me on the pricing, but rather they're asking me, what else can we do? Can you add this? Can we do that? Is this in here? And, you know, half the time they're asking these things, you're like, oh, let's go to the outline. I've already got that here, right? I'm describing what the experience should look like when you, when you, when you move ahead from this stage to the stage of completion or near completion, right? And mind you, when you agree on the price, you should agree on what's going to be included. By that time, you should have the whole outline flushed out. And you should agree on a certain number of iterations of updates and revisions. Web designers do this if they're smart, right? They say, all right, we're going to build out the site. Here's all the pages we're going to have. And here's all the content that's going to go on the pages. And we'll do two or three revisions. And then after that, anything else is considered a change order, right? In other words, you want to clearly define what's going to be included in the manual. And you want to define where the line is after which you need to charge them something extra for what they're asking you for right? You need to make that understanding very clear right up front so that it doesn't, so that it doesn't become, you know, so that we don't see animosity enter into the equation later on, right? That's so, so important. Um, And Matthew just said it in the chat, pretty much what I was just saying in better words. So I'll say it. You want to be in the right mindset to do this, right? If you're excited because you're thinking, oh my God, I'm getting paid better than I could have ever expected. And again, you're not thinking about the time now. You're thinking about how, can, how much more can I add to this to make it great, right? How can I make this thing amazing for the client? How can I deliver something that's going to blow the client away? That should be your mindset when you're going to create this, and you should price it accordingly, right? Because that makes a big difference. If you don't truly feel like you're getting paid enough, then there's going to come a point in time where the time you're spending on this is going to cause resentment, right? You're going to get annoyed by it instead of being excited about it, right? And that's the key. So you have to think in terms of what's this whole thing going to look like when I have it all flushed out and then put some numbers in front of yourself and gauge your reaction. If I'm charging $250 for this, probably not going to get a good reaction out of it when you consider the effort that you're going to want to be able to put in. If I said charge 5,000, you have a different reaction, but that might seem a little ridiculous. That might give you, give you a sense of being, you know, unfair, right? A thousand dollars. I don't know. I think a thousand dollars feels very fair for something like this, maybe even 1500, right? At this point in the stage, when you're trying to come up with the pricing, it's organic. It's, there's no formula I can give you. It's not how many hours is it going to take times an hourly rate? That's wrong. That's all wrong. We've proven that theory wrong over and over for years now, right? That's not the way to do this. Then the client gets a paper shock bill because the hours are much more than they ever expected, right? So Jessica says she charges $1,200 depending on complexity, right? 
so yeah, that seems about right for something like this. Like I said, a thousand to fifteen hundred feels good to me, right? I'd be excited to build something like this for a client for that amount of money. Um, and if let's say they and, and you can do add-ons, you can say, look, we can make it more video intensive if you want to spend a little more money, you know, because the videos take more time to produce. It's more effort, but it's also a lot more value because now you have something much more visual, right? And now I'm creating almost like a course for you instead of just a manual. So maybe that's worth twenty five hundred. Right at twenty five hundred dollars, I'll do I'll do I'll do videos everywhere. I'll do videos all day, you know, um, you know. So and the bottom line is, so you put the numbers in front of you, right? You list the numbers out. Let me just get up like a little kind of scrap sheet here. Um, hey Seth, yes, sir. Could some of these be like generic chunks where you would cut and paste and maybe customize with videos, or does it? Or One do more the, time, I'm not sure I follow. I understand oh, the question. Do the do the um pictures need to match the videos or could you have like generic chunks and then customize it with video so that you'd have like a skeleton you could just start fleshing out rather than having yeah, I mean, to do think it. about the user experience right like what might be cool is to start with a screenshot but then have a link to a video that kind of brings that screenshot to life right yeah. so that it would follow a certain order maybe Right. I'm just thinking rather than having to recreate each one from scratch just have parts where you can cut and paste and like, you know, have an out generic outline that you could customize for, the, which would take you a lot less time rather than having to, you know, redo everything. Uh, so now you've lost me again. Do you mean creating like a generic manual that you can carbon copy from one client to the next? And maybe customize with videos and... I, the only reason I don't love that idea is I think from a user experience perspective, it makes a big difference if they see their own actual bank. And that's what I was wondering, you know, is it... I think for, I mean, you could do it. I don't love the idea, and I think for what we're talking about charging, it's fair to the client to give them something that really gives them their own context and use case. I mean, yes, you can do it. Absolutely. It will save you time, but I think, the, I think you're creating a better experience for the client when you're using their own actual QuickBooks file, you know, and, and they see accounts that they recognize. Oh, these are my bank accounts. It's just, it's a different feeling. I remember years ago, I did a quick video for a client on his own set of books, and I sent it to him and he was blown away. He, he actually sent me an email remarking how cool it was to see his own books in the, in, you know, in the video that I did. And I get that here you're saying that's what you would do on the video side of it, um, that the screenshots could be generic. Again, it could work, but I just think it's an even better experience for the client if we take the time to, you know, to, you could follow the, you could follow the template and take screenshots of the same things. That's what I was I'd, thinking maybe, um, for example, have a generic for myself and then say, okay, I need to get this shot for the, the, from the client's books rather than just use a generic. Yeah. I mean, you could certainly do a generic outline and template there, but I think I'd still be inclined to want to update the screenshots for that client's books. You know, yeah, yeah. I would say try it both ways. Obviously it's going to save you some time to use, you know, to template it as much as possible. Do it one. Do it for one client one way. Do it for another client the other way. And gauge the reaction, the difference. Right? You might be able to get away with charging more also because you're taking the time to give them something that is purely in the context of what their bookkeeping right. looks like. Right? So I think it could go either way. But so getting back to the pricing conversation, I don't want to because I you know I had a specific plan on what I want to focus on for this part. You know, so you want to look here and look at those prices. Right? Thinking about what I'm going to do for the client. Right, here's the price range. Like I said, you're gonna look at these numbers and you're gonna get a feeling. 250 obviously doesn't feel like nearly enough, right? A thousand feels maybe right, maybe 1500. Let's just call it a thousand to 2500 if we wanna do, the, give them the video intensive option, right? Again, it's always good to give them some extra options. Um, and 5000, you know, probably feels like you're ripping them off a little bit. That might be a little much for an accounting manual, right? Um, so look at these like and like i said here's how you're gauging it either it feels right on or it feels like way too much or it feels like more than enough right and more than enough is the one you're looking for you're looking for it to feel like more than enough because that usually means that you're you're going to feel good about what you're creating. You're, it means you're pricing it in such a way that you feel good about what you're doing, that you're not going to think or worry about the time. You're going to be willing to put in the extra time and effort because time is no longer a factor because you're being paid so well to do this, right? That's the organic kind of gut feeling 
that you're looking for is it feels like more than enough. That's, that's where it should be. That's where it should land in your gut, right? And, and it's all relative, right? And I'll, I'll share a story with you. So this week, just this week, or let me back up a couple of weeks, I had a client reach out to me and said, hey, we're thinking about selling our company. Um, you know, we need to do some kind of a look at the numbers to get a sense of the valuation, right? So I said, okay, you know what? I can do like a little Shark Tank-like analysis of this for you, you know, and put that together. And that's all I said. This guy, in my experience, has proven to be a little wishy-washy. He'll come and say he wants to do something. Then he disappears for two weeks. Then he comes back and says, can we get started? Then he disappears. So I've learned not to invest too much energy into, you know, what he's asking for until I know he's serious about it. So, so he, and he started sending me files, right? And saying, okay, here's files with, you know, last year's numbers and, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, he said, let me know if you need anything. And I was busy. So I, again, I didn't pay it much mind. Then this week he comes to me and says, hey, do you think you can have that for me by tomorrow? And I'm like, whoa, wait, like we haven't even talked about pricing yet. And he wants me to finish the job. <laughs> so, you know, and it's all relative because, you know, if I was in a very different place, if I really needed business, I might have been inclined to just, you know, he's an existing client. They pay me at the lowest possible range for basic monthly bookkeeping. I might have been inclined to just do it for him as a favor, just to be a nice guy. But that's not the place I'm in. You know, I'm in a place where I'm up to my eyeballs, you know, doing what I'm doing and getting paid to do what I do. And it's like, if I decide to take out the time to build this for him, and, and for me, this is a fun project that's, you know, you know, something I don't mind doing at all. In fact, I get excited about doing it because it's the kind of thing I love to do. But, you know, I had to stop and think the time I'm going to spend doing this is going to take me away from doing other things, things I'm getting paid for. Right. And so I had to stop and find a polite way to make that point for him. So I said, hold on. I said, first of all, on that short notice, no. I said, there's no way I can get this to you that quickly. And then I went on to say, and we haven't talked about the fee yet. I said, I can do this for you, but you know, I need $1,000 and then I'll give you a complete set of projected financials, balance sheet, P&L, and statement of cash flows. And even $1,000 is very low for, for that kind of a you know, projected set of financial statements. Normally, I wouldn't consider doing something like this for less than about $2,500. It's a lot of work to build it out, to get everything balanced and to build it in such a way that I can create and tweak the drivers or assumptions and see how that impacts the cash flow. You know, there's a lot involved in building something like this. And, th and it takes a lot of expertise, right? And that expertise that I've spent many, many hours for years and years and years developing is worth something. And I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I agreed to do something like that for somebody for free, no matter how much I might love them, right? So the point is, it's all relative. I have to think about where I'm at. I would have been willing to do it for him for $1,000. I thought that was more than fair, especially given the context I just provided. And uh, so I wrote him that message in Slack, and I haven't heard a peep from him since, which tells me clearly he thought I was just going to do this for free. I don't have time to do this for free, right? And there's no reason I should, be, there's no reason somebody should ask me to do something like this for free. If anything, in my mind, he should have come straight out and asked me, how much is this going to cost me? That tells me that he has respect for the value that I bring. When somebody asks me to do something and they're not clearly inclined to offer to pay for it, they're not, they're not demonstrating that they have a real respect for the value of what I can do for them. You know, a lot of people won't. And then when I'll ask it, it'll be like, oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't think about that. Of course, you know, of course I need to pay for that, right? But I like it a lot better when they come straight out with the respect that I feel like I deserve in terms of just coming straight out and saying, and let me know what this is going to cost me. That tells me that they expect it to cost them something, that they're not expecting anything for free, that they have no sense of entitlement, right? Um and so again, you know, this could be a really fun project, but you, you want to get paid something that makes you comfortable enough to be willing to get excited and spend plenty of time. Like I said, that's one of the key factors is you shouldn't even be sweating it when it comes to the amount of time you're spending. You want to spend all the time you can. I'll spend the whole day on the thing, you know, or many days on the thing because I'm getting paid that well, right? Um, you know, and like I said, you can you can do add-ons and options for like more video, more videos on something like this. You know, and why not? Because as I've suggested, it's going to be in an online format, accessible. 
and I can easily add more videos and add the links in, swap things out, do an updated video. Cubio changed its interface. Here's a video that shows you the same stuff that was in the manual, but you know what it looks like with the new interfaces. And that's where a support plan can really come in, right? Where you're providing monthly support by way of training, but also by way of keeping this document fresh and up to date, you know, where and when applicable, necessary, most importantly, when it's helpful, right? So think about the range. If they come back to you and say, you know, I don't think I want to spend $1,500 on an accounting manual, then be prepared to say, well, here's what I can do for $500. You know, I can basically give you this outline with just a brief, it's going to be all text, just a brief description of what needs to be done in each area on a weekly basis. For $500, I can do that, right? It's just going to be a text written manual, you know, no screenshots, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do all this for $500. But I will do, you know, this and a little bit more, a little bit more details filled in for $500. Given the range, most of the time when you present the client with the two extremes of the range and, and they can clearly see the difference in the value, it's going to be a no-brainer. In fact, this option at $500 is going to make them feel like they're being cheap if they choose it, right? There's a lot of psychology to that that I've read about. When you give them, you know, the idea is, the expensive option, which is the one that has the real value, is going to make the cheap option look cheap, right? And, and then Matthew points out in the chat, maybe on the lower end, that's where you would use the templated version and frankly put minimal effort into, you know, updating it much more than what you have as, as the generic template, right? And that makes sense. So again, it's always the price is adjusted based on the value of what you're going to deliver them right? But it also has to be balanced with what's going to get you excited to do it. To be honest, the cheap version would already just bore me to tears. Even though it might be an easy $500, I almost wouldn't want to do it just because it's boring, right? I have other things I'd rather do. Creating something like this, to me, is fun and exciting because it's just really cool. It's a cool experience I can create for somebody. Um, and just, I wanted to throw this out there as we're coming up on the end of the hour. Another avenue that you can take on something like this is you can, if you, let's say you know that your client is, let's say your client's using ClickUp with you. Instead of the Google Doc version, you can build out a generic space and template in ClickUp with all the tasks. ClickUp does the video embeds beautifully. You can really spec out this whole thing in, the, in a ClickUp space, you know, really fleshed out, and that template can easily be delivered to the client and now they have something they can replicate and turn into actual tasks that whoever's going to be doing the work can now take over in the ClickUp environment. And of course, I'm just using ClickUp as the example because that's my sort of favorite project management app of choice. Um, but you can probably do something similar with Asana or Teamwork or whatever you're using, right? But the point is, as another option to, another route to go is instead of the Google Doc format, just build out a template in ClickUp that outlines everything that needs to be done every week, month, quarter, and year for that client all year long, right? And that's another option to go. And again, it goes back to the same thing. Start the outline, build out the first section, screen share, show them what it looks like in ClickUp, get them excited about the prospect of having a complete, you know, manual like this, and then, you know, see where they want to go. See if they want to spend the money on something like that. Maybe that's worth $2,500 you know, and, and then again, always when you're doing something like this for a client, tack on some kind of a monthly support option. Look for 500 bucks a month. I'll support this all day long. I'll, I'll get you in a Slack workspace or you can keep me in the ClickUp project and, you know, and you can ask me all the questions you want and I'll answer them and get you the help and support that you need, you know. So you always want to try and upsell to some kind of a monthly support option because A, there's a ton of value in that. You can give them ongoing help and get questions answered. B, it increases, you know, I've said this before, it's been a while since we talked about this. In your own business, there's basically three ways to increase your revenues, right? You can increase your prices, you can uh, increase the number of clients you get, but most importantly, you can increase the number of times a client buys from you get them to buy more than once by paying a one-time fee for the manual and then a monthly fee for the, for the ongoing support. It is a great way to increase the number of times a client buys from you, which is a great way. In fact, I'd say it's the best way to increase your top line on your own P&L is by increasing the number of times a client buys for you. The way you do that is give them options for more things that you can do for them that will provide value that they'll be very happy to pay for, right? 
And then you have a responsibility to show them, here's all the options, here's what I can do for you, here's what it's gonna cost for me to do that for you. Let them choose, right? Let them decide how far they wanna go.